Thank you, Chloe. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm Mark Bogosian. I'm the director of the Quality, Quality of Life Grants Program here at the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. And I'd like to welcome all of you to the, um, the technical assistance webinar for the High Impact Innovative Assistive Technology Grants. And we'll just call that Hyatt from now on because that's a, a mouthful. Um, so as, as some of you may know, the grant cycle opened last week on July 15th, and we're accepting applications through September 16th. Uh, these slides, they'll be uploaded onto the Reeve Foundation website, and um, we'll be putting that up shortly after the webinar. Um, I'm going to attempt to um, answer questions during this webinar at the end, if time permits. Um, so, however, um, just, you know, questions about the application process received um, that I don't get to um, or that are submitted after the webinar will be collected and aggregated and answered, and we'll put those all into a question and answers document and post those on our website as well along with these slides and this presentation. Um, so, but for today, just, you know, please submit your questions uh, through the chat box, and I think you can all see the chat box now. Um, and after the webinar, if you have any questions, please submit those to QOL at ChristopherReeve.org. Um, this email will be visible in an upcoming slide, so just, um, you know, and I'll be saying it a few more times. Uh, the question, uh, the, the deadline actually for receiving the emailed questions is this Friday, July 26th. So what that means is all of the questions that we receive by them, you know, we'll put together, put on the website so that everyone has a chance to see them. Um, you know, any questions that you have afterwards, please, you know, still don't hesitate to ask. Um, however, I do have to say that, you know, the foundation is no longer able to provide individual pre-award assistance, which is different from technical assistance. And what that really means is that we can't really speak about the merit of your proposal or assist you in thinking about the best scope of work for your proposal or offer any kind of programmatic direction um, because doing so would be uh, seen as providing unfair advantage over other applicants. So, um, you know, I just thank you for understanding that, but um, certainly any questions that you have, uh, you know, to a technical matter or, you know, today I'm certainly more than happy to answer and respond to for the whole group. So just a quick overview, what we're going to talk about today is who can apply for these grants. I'll give a short introduction into the Reeve Foundation, the National Paralysis Resource Center, and the overall Quality of Life Grants Program. Then we'll delve into the um, Hyatt Grants. Uh, we'll talk about the program description, types of projects funded, allowable expenses, unallowable expenses, and then kind of the more nitty gritty stuff is accessing the online grants portal, um, the application process, and then, you know, what to expect if you are, um, if you were to be awarded a Hyatt grant. So let's jump right in, and if you're joining this, um, you, you may already know this, or you hopefully would know this, but um, eligible applicants are restricted to state and territory AT programs that are funded through the State Assistive Technology Act, um, and that does include implementing agencies and agencies subcontracted for assistive technology, which are the Section 4 activities. Um, those agencies, though, that are subcontracted um, must include in your application a letter from the AT Act funded program in your state or territory that verifies that there's a written agreement in place with your agency to provide the Section 4 activities. And also, um, the letter should state that your agency provides data for the AT annual performance report, which is um, also known as the APR. So just uh, very quickly and briefly, um, the, you know, the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation's reach 
uh, they stretch back to 1982 when a New Jersey high school student whose name was Henry Seifel was involved in a car accident that left him um, paralyzed at the age of 17. And what started as a community-driven um, Stifle Paralysis Research Foundation, it soon became the American Paralysis Association, the APA. And then in 1995, when the actor Christopher Reeve was injured, um, the APA was one of the first places that he and his wife Dana turned to. Um, and then by 1999, the APA became the Christopher Reeve Foundation, and Dana's name was added um, after her untimely passing in, in 2006. Um, we are paralysis focused as a foundation and that really means that our grants must be targeted to projects that serve individuals living with paralysis as well as their families and their caregivers. And we use a functional definition of paralysis which is difficulty or inability to use arms and or legs due to neurological conditions. Um, including but not limited to spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, stroke, cerebral palsy, spina bifida, ALS, uh, post polio syndrome, um, and, um, among others. So the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation's uh, Quality of Life Grants Program, which this is a part of, the, uh, you know, the Hyatt Grants are a part of, um, was created by the late Dana Reeve. And uh, since its inception in 1997, we've funded over $26 million to more than 3,000 projects across the United States. And for the whole program, those grants would have been funded to nonprofits, tribal entities, and municipalities, and it, it for a whole wide array of projects, programs, and services. Um, but since 2014, um, the Quality of Life grants have been federally funded through a cooperative agreement with the United States Department of Health and Human Services, the um, Administration for Community Living, ACL. So, and I'll obviously be using that acronym a lot through this webinar. So I just want to touch briefly on the National Paralysis Resource Center um, because a, a lot of you, you know, may not be aware of this and, and there's just uh, so much to, you know, to, to learn about and offer. So uh, the National Paralysis Resource Center has also been federally funded uh, since 2014 through a cooperative agreement with ACL. And the National uh, PRC, what it, what it does is it really provides deeply needed information programs and individualized support and assistance to over 5.3 million Americans living with paralysis. Um, I'd like to just take a few seconds here to highlight the National Paralysis Resource Center, again, so that you're aware of all of the services that we can offer to you, but also that, you know, we can offer to your stakeholders. Um, the, the foundation of the National PRC are our information specialists, and they've provided one-on-one -on -one assistance to over 100 thousand families in 170 languages, and that's through phone calls and emails. Um, the, the people served range from those living with paralysis, those newly injured or diagnosed, uh, those living with paralysis for 20 plus years, um, family members, friends who have questions. Um, they are really, again, the, the foundation of what the National Paralysis Resource Center is and are here to answer any number of questions on every aspect. So please, um, you know, if you have any questions for them, contact them and, you know, you can also contact them through me if, if you need to. Um, we also have a military and veterans program which supports the unique needs of our servicemen and women, a peer and family support program with over 380 certified peer mentors, and they've provided support to over 11,000 people. Um, we have a virtual community of over 3 million users who visit our website and Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and other social media outlets. There's also Reeve Connect, which is a private forum for our community, which again is, you know, uh, those people living with paralysis, their families and friends, caretakers, um, and 
paralysis and disabilities related organizations. And I invite all of you to, to sign up and to add your voice and to share your ex expertise. Um, so please do so um, by going to our website at www.christopherreeve.org um, and you'll see an, an area for Reeve Connect, which is a really, um, really great um, service that, that the National Paralysis Resource Center offers. Uh, the Quality of Life Grants uh, is also a part of the National Resource Center and the Hyatt Grants are a part of the Quality of Life Grants and they are also funded through the cooperative agreement with ACL. Um, and I just want to add that the, what is really exciting is that as of last month we actually funded just over $26 million uh, to over 3,000 programs. So that was um, uh, May and June were really kind of big months for us and it was uh, really exciting to be able to make those awards and really affect all of the, those people that, that will be served by those grants. Um, just lastly, the National PRC provides free health-related resources and information um, and materials. Um, all of these resources are free, including our flagship publication, which is the Paralysis Resource Guide. Um, you'll see through this slide there's, you know, all these kinds of publications and brochures on, you know, bladder management, uh, skin pressure, you know, pressure injuries and skin management. There are different wallet cards that people can carry on them and bring to their doctor um, or to the ER if they end up there, which, you know, talk about sepsis or, or um, deep vein thrombosis and, you know, a number of other, other topics. So, um, you know, we just really do invite you to reach out to us for any of these materials, both for your own organizations, but also for all of the people that you do serve. Um, before beginning your grant application, uh, we really recommend that you read the application and program guidelines, which provides uh, information about the Hyatt Grants program. Now, much of this is covered in this webinar, but it's always good to have it on hand. Um, it also really helps you familiarize yourself with the application process and to better prepare for the required information that is requested in the application. Um, also available on our website is the People First Language Guide, which are guidelines for discussing people with disabilities. Um, and there's also a quick guide to establishing evaluation indicators. Uh, the, the grant application actually requires that you describe evaluation indicators that you'll use to measure the success of your project. Um, the indicators must be a combination of both input and output indicators, and they must be measurable. Um, you'll also be asked to describe the evaluation methods that you're going to use, you know, which it, it could be surveys, interviews, focus groups, review of uh, program documents. Um, but I would say please take a look at the, you know, the guide to establishing evaluation indicators as it will really help you in preparing a, a more full and robust um, application. Um, so the Hyatt program itself, it was launched in 2015 and it offers one-year grants of up to $75,000 to state and territory AT programs that are, you know, funded through the State Assistive Technology Act. Um, and, you know, as I've uh, noted before, this obviously includes the implementing agencies and the agencies subcontracted for the AT Section 4 activities. Um, since 2015, we've made 19 grants, totaling almost $1.4 million, um, and those have gone to those AT programs in the states listed here on this slide. Uh, grant funds are designed to help the state programs expand their reach through new innovations that will impact people living with paralysis. Awarded grant funds uh, will support innovative programs or services that target a specific, well-defined, underserved population within the broader disability community or, um, you know, in their state or in their territory. And I'd like to just take a moment here to define underserved population. Um, 
yes, projects uh, should serve individuals living with paralysis with one of uh, or more of what is considered traditionally underserved populations, which um, this will all be listed on the application, but it, it, that includes you know, people of color, ethnic minorities, low-income populations, uh, those that are limited English proficient, those living in rural populations, um, LGBT persons, older adults with paralysis and their caregivers, um, families coping with new acquired in, uh, disabilities. Um, this also, though, does include those at risk for incarceration, uh, current or uh, recently released prisoners, as well as military service members and veterans. And again, that, that full list is going to be um, on your application. Uh, the program also, um, through AT devices or services, uh, will increase access to those services, thereby increasing the independence or inclusion of people within the underserved populations within their communities. Um, and when these uh, programs are complete, they will have a, a demonstrable direct impact on the people they serve by the project. And in addition to that last bullet, I just want to remind you that these are one-time, one-year grants. And for you to think about sustainability, um, the application does require um, for you to describe how you intend to sustain key project activities beyond the one-year grant period. So really, you know, please keep that in mind, too. The program has been designed to encourage and foster collaboration, um, collaboration being the important word here, collaboration among existing agencies, nonprofits, and networks that serve people living with paralysis through really innovative assistive technology projects. Um, to maximize the project's efficacy, it's expected that funded agencies will partner with other organizations in the activities of the proposed project. But partners are not required to commit funds, but they must demonstrate measurable commitment that will increase the probability of the success of the project. So uh, because of that, letters of collaboration by the partners must be included in the application. So here's kind of the big news for this year, right? And, and we, along with ACL, are really excited that we have been able to make these changes to the grants program. And the biggest um, change is that previously funded organizations are now eligible to apply, which um, is really exciting because, you know, with each year uh, it, it was dwindling down the, the number of uh, applicants. And we just felt that let us, you know, open it, let everybody who even has um, been a previous grantee apply. However, here are the few um, you know, things to really know about that is that past grantees must submit proposals for new and innovative projects and not replications of what they were previously awarded for. The other thing is that the past grantees, they have to be in good standing with the Reed Foundation. And what that really means is that you've successfully closed out your past grant, and that includes having you know, submitted your final report on time, indicating the program accomplishments, and also showing that all of the grant funds are, were fully expended as they related to the awarded grant budget. So, that's, those are the kind of new, the big new things. Um, the other new thing is that this, uh, the cycle usually opened in November, which, uh, you know, people found very difficult to work with that schedule with the holidays, et cetera. So um, we've moved it back to July, and we're also giving a full two-month application period, which, um, you know, will hopefully give everybody the opportunity to put their applications together, get them in, and also to get them in by September 16th. So I just want to cover allowable costs. Um, so 
the allowable costs include what's up here, which, but it, it's not limited to these, but equipment, training, personnel costs, facility rental, outreach, travel, and I've listed here some of the breakdown in travel just because um, we adhere to um, certain guidelines within our um, federal cooperative agreement and those therefore are passed on to you. So, you know, airfare can't be more than $500, train uh, $275, hotel has a limit of $225 per night, and mileage is reimbursable at um, 58 cents per mile. So just, you know, something to think if you're including travel in your budget line. Um, and I just want to give you an, an idea of what past grants have done. Um, so uh, some of our past grants have supported assistive technology equipment um, demonstrations and equipment loans, either through loan closets or lending libraries. Um, some of the equipment that they've loaned out, um, you know, a, a whole range of things, but temporary ramps, standers, uh, eye gaze devices, smart home devices, adaptive sports equipment, um, you know, the, just those are, uh, you know, a few of what we've funded in the past through both the loan closets and also the demonstration um, aspect of this. Um, other projects have provided wheelchair accessible scales and digital mapping technology to health centers in rural communities, um, or one facilitated early mobility and assisted young children in walking, um, and yet another also um, increased outdoor physical activities through exercise and recreation through um, assistive technology and um, adaptive devices. So unallowable costs, and I'm going to read through these um, just so that you hear them and, uh, you know, so that you're aware of them. Grant funds cannot be used for grants awarded directly to individuals. Um, no food whatsoever, and, and that can be, you know, looked at as meals, per diem, board, lunch, beverages, alcohol. Um, we're not able to fund construction. Um, however, we, you know, are able to do um, accessibility um, modifications. So, you know, some facility modifications, et cetera. So, um, just not major construction projects. Um, we can't fund projects that cannot be completed within the 12 months of the receipt of the grant funds. Um, we can't fund projects that have already been completed because then you know, it falls out of line. Uh, because this is a, um, you know, a federal grant program that we are a part of, um, you need to utilize contractors and vendors that are within the United States and its territories. So an unallowable cost would be you know, a contractor or vendor that is outside of the U.S. Um, and its territories. Um, the other thing is, especially in this AT environment or, you know, atmosphere, to, to think about we cannot fund the development of prototypes for invention of equipment or other research and developmental activities that would involve intellectual property rights. And uh, lastly, um, and this of course is a big one too, is we can't fund lobbying or any efforts to influence legislation. Um, you know, and we don't really see that that much in the Hyatt Grants Program, but um, I do need to say that, and it is something though that we have seen um, in our other grant programs. So just a quick, here's the timeline. You know, we opened last week. Today is the webinar. Questions submitted uh, either through the chat box or through QOL at ChristopherReeve.org. Um, Christopher those will be, um, you know, again, we'll pull those together, put them up on the website. Um, those questions will be due by July 26th. The application deadline is the September 16th. Now, the application review is a, a really long process.
process. Um, the applications are reviewed by a, a really diverse and expert committee of external reviewers, and that does take a while. So, um, you know, we're giving it a month. Sometimes it goes longer. Um, so we're looking at decision announcements at the beginning of November. So what that really means for all of you to think about is in planning your projects is to think about the grant year, the 12-month period for you being December 1st, 2019 through November 30th, 2020. So the, the, high, the, the grant application itself is completed online through a link to the Reed Foundation online grants portal. Um, that link is available on our website. It's also available in the grant application and program guidelines, which you can also find on our website. Um, and you can also, um, once these slides are posted, um, you can, uh, you know, paste or copy and paste that URL, um, the URL that's shown underneath uh, the, the first highlighted um, you know, ReFoundation Online Grants Portal, um, post that, paste that into your uh, website browser. Um, and we also ask, and this is really important, is that you please add QOL at ChristopherReeve.org and administrator at grantinterface.com to your acceptable email address lists um, to avoid having them or, or any email communications from them or from us be blocked by a spam blocker uh, software. And the administrator at grantinterface.com, those emails are the ones that are going to be coming to you directly from the online system, which means that um, you can, um, you know, once you submit it, it'll send you something back saying submit. A lot of times if there's a question or two that we have, we'll ask you questions through that. Um, we'll also be announcing, you know, through that that, you know, you've, if you've received an award. So, um, and we've had people that have not gotten those uh, because it's been in their spam box. So we just please make sure that those are um, on your safe lists. So after clicking on the link to access the Reef Foundation grant portal, you're going to be brought to the logon page. And if this is the first time that you're applying for a Hyatt grant, you're going to need to create a new account. So you'll click on the new account, uh, it's actually see the create new account button, um, and you'll be asked to input contact information and information about your organization, um, thus really creating an organizational profile. And if you need any assistance, there's a link to a registration tutorial video over here on the right-hand side um, on this portal page here, or you can always just email us at qol at christopherreeve.org. Um, if you have applied in the past, then please um, enter the email address and password that you've previously created. Now, if you've forgotten that password, which you know I certainly always do, just click on Forgot Your Password link, um, and an email will be sent to you with your password. And if you don't remember or have access to the email account related to the organization, just contact us, again, qol at christopherreeve.org for assistance. Um, it's just it's really important that you enter an email address and password that is already connected with the organization's account. Um, and we ask that you please do not create a duplicate organizational profile as all of the organizational application history is connected to that grant profile. So it, um, you know, in many ways it's a, it's a great way to capture all of the information that you've uh, shared in the past. So, you know, please make sure not to duplicate your organizational profile. Um, the other thing is please be sure to just review your own organization and your own contact information as well as the other uh, people that may be in the system and to update them with the most current information. Um, you know, just this last cycle, you know, somebody had a Comcast email and they entered it as, you know, Comcast. So, 
um, whenever we would send emails to them, it never got to them because they had input the incorrect information. So just please, especially with your email address, make sure that um, that you uh, just double check that. So here's the 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 big <laughs> the big the big piece. So the restricted access code for this grant process is AT2019, and you're going to be asked to input that restricted access code. Um, we give that for the Hyatt grants because um, our other grant programs, you know, will have up to 400 or, or more applications or uh, you know applicants. Um, and you know this being such a small group, and because it, you know the restriction as to who can apply, we put a restricted access code on. So that code is AT 2019. And once you've created your new account or have logged on to the portal, um, you're going to be brought to this apply page, and it's here that you enter the access code right up on top. It says enter access code and that's where you're going to put in the AT2019. And then once you've entered the access, clo uh, the access code and you've clicked on the apply button um, on the right hand uh, side, that's that button in blue, um, you're going to be you know, you'll see the, um, you know, the breakdown of what, uh, you know, what the program is. You hit the apply button and it'll bring you right into the application. Um, and again, just uh, please remember that the deadline for the application submission is Monday, uh, September 16th, and it's at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. So that means the, it's something that's hardwired into the system. At 11.59, if you are still submitting, it will stop and it won't allow you to submit. So please um, be aware of that deadline at 11.59 p.m., just right before midnight, um, and that is on Monday, September 16th. So once you've clicked on that up, uh, the blue Apply button, um, you're going to be brought to the application. Um, so you can print out the application questions, and to do so, just click on the question list. It's the button up at the top on the right hand, um, and a Word document will be downloaded. Um, these application questions are also uh, they're available in the Grant Application and Program Guidelines, which are you know on our website. Um, a list of the application questions that are downloaded. It includes the paragraph counts for text limits. Um, and I think the, you know, what I like about this is some applicants find it really helpful to create their draft application in the Word document um, because then it can be used to cut and paste your answers into the text fields in the online uh, application. So the application itself is broken down into the following sections. There's organizational information, proposed project information, uh, project plan and timeline, collaboration, demonstrating impact, um, which is the evaluation, um, the project evaluation plan, um, project staffing plan, sustainability, and budget information. And we ask that, you know, obviously please respond to all of the questions, noting that the fields with an asterisk are required. Um, and you can save your application at any time and come back to it by pressing the Save button on the, at the bottom. And then when you've completed your application, you just hit that Submit Application button at the right hand, um, at the bottom right hand of the form. But let's take a closer look at the application. Um, so the following, th this is really just an example of the types of questions you're going to be asked to answer. Some of them are yes or no. You know, are you the implementing agency in your state or territory? Yes or no. So you know, these just gather information for us to know who you are as an, app, uh, as an organization. Um, this is um, an example of the types of questions you're going to be asked to answer um, in a narrative form. Um, note that you're given character limits at the bottom. Um, 
3,000 characters equals about one page of a Word document. So 10,000 characters is about three pages of a Word document. And we don't require at all that you use all of those allotted characters, but just know that the system won't allow you to go over that number. So you're limited to that, um, you know, what's listed there. For those of you that have applied in the past, um, you know, whether you have received funding or not, just please be aware that we've revised our project budget line template. Um, so what you do is you, you type in the budget line item, you type in the total cost of the line item, and then the requested amount. Just um, the subtotal and total cost, they will formulate automatically. Um, and please note that these are the following budget areas. There's personnel cost, equipment, consultants, contractors, supplies, travel, um, and other costs. Uh, a subtotal for each budget area will formulate into the bottom. So that whole list that you just saw really goes from top to bottom, this being the bottom. Um, and it will formulate into the bottom section of this template. So the total funds requested will mirror those that are above in the line item budget. Um, we also ask, and um, you know, uh, this doesn't always apply to uh, the higher grants, though, it, you know, please, if there are other funding sources, we ask that you include them um, to please include other funding sources um, and note if the funding is committed or pending. Um, the other thing that we've done that's new is um, we've included a budget narrative requirement. And what this really does is it, it, it helps us get a better understanding of what the grant funds are being used for. So um, we ask that the, you know, the budget narrative include a description and justification of each budget category and line item that you've presented in your proposed budget. So all expenses should clearly relate to the budget line that's requested. Um, and as, you, as you'll see, the areas mirror those that were on the uh, budget template. So once you've responded to the questions and uploaded the required documents, you know, such as those budget templates or the uh, letters of support, um, just simply hit the Submit Application button. Um, button. And then once you do that, a uh, submission confirmation page will appear. At the same time, the system will also send you an, in, um, an email indicating that your application has been received. So again, please be sure that your email address has been entered correctly. Um, and note that these are going to be the, um, the system emails that uh, are coming from administrator at grant interface. Dot com. So all applicants um, will be notified by email if their application has been approved or declined. Um, if your project has been awarded, um, you'll be asked to indicate your acceptance of the grant through email. Um, through a correspondence that we'll be reaching out to you with. Once that um, indicate, you know, once you've indicated that you will accept the, the grant, um, a grant agreement will be issued. Uh, the grant award agreement must be countersigned, and then grant checks will be issued upon receipt of that countersigned uh, award agreement. And we'll also provide you with a press release template to help you publicize the grant award. Um, you know, just the other, another thing that we do is we, we regularly feature our grantees on social media, on our website, and newsletters or other, other publications, annual reports, et cetera. So um, we may call on you to provide stories and photographs that we can share with our community. I don't know if uh, some of you were available last week um, for the um, RESNA ADA webinar in which we had to 
former grantees, um, South Carolina and Florida, talk about their um, high impact innovative assistive technology um, grants. Um, and I just, you know, I, w I know this will sound crazy, but I love reading um, the, the reports that the, the grantees send in. I learned so much from them. Um, so it's, it's really a pleasure to read those. And I'd love to do more of those types of webinars too. So, um, you know, that's something to look forward to in the future. There are, and I mentioned this just a, a moment ago, there are some mandatory requirements that um, must be met uh, for you to be in compliance with the QOL grant program. Um, and that is there, that you must submit two progress reports to the foundation. One is a six-month interim report, and that really is just to kind of let us know that the project is proceeding as planned or not. Um, and if not, then that gives us the opportunity to, to think about what we can do to help you get it back on track. So, um, you know, it's not a bad thing. Things happen. Um, you know, it, it, everything looks wonderful on paper, and you know, and everybody you know works really hard to plan these things. But sometimes other things happen. So, the interim report uh, is actually a great opportunity to you know to kind of check in. Uh, gives us the opportunity to see where we can offer any help. Um, and, and we've, you know, we certainly have done that many a time, um, not only for the, you know, Hyatt Grants Program, but for others. Um, a final report will also be required, and that will be due one month after the close of the grant. And that, too, is going to, you know, detail the, pro the, the progress, the challenges, how the challenges were addressed. Uh, the project's impact and, uh, you know, a full accounting of the grant expenditures. And, you know, I, I, um, I do want to say this, that we learn a lot from the challenges that you face. So, um, you know, don't ever feel afraid to share those challenges with us. Um, it's how we learn. It's how um, you learn, and it's how we better not only the grants program, but we better, you know, all of the services that we offer to, you know, to our community. Um, the other thing that we do are site visits, which, um, you know, I do them. Some of uh, the quality of life grant staff, uh, sometimes our board of directors, um, and again, it, it's a. This is a great opportunity for us to see what's happening in person, to see your successes, to see your challenges, and you know to assist with those challenges if any come up. But um, they're always fun. Um, it's we, a great learning experience for everyone. So um, you know, just know that that too is is most likely a part of it. Um, and lastly, uh, there's a, an evaluation uh, component which. Um, is conducted by Vanderbilt University. And what that really allows you to do is just to offer really candid feedback about the overall grant experience. You know, uh, even questions about this webinar. Was this webinar helpful? Was the how, you know, what, what was the process like for you? Because it's only by those types of uh, responses can we improve upon the program. So, Now, I touched base on this uh, a little bit earlier, um, you know, when I was talking about providing programmatic direction. So just, you know, in adherence with our uh, federal cooperative agreement, we were unable to comment on denied applications if, you know, unfortunately you were to be denied, uh, you know, your application were to be denied funding, um, nor are we able to really provide programmatic direction. And again, it's, it, it's that the whole way of viewing unfair advantage and, um, you know, we, we really are not able to do that. But again, any questions that you are able to ask me here, um, and again, if I'm not able to get to them, um, you know, we will put those together and answer them on the um, Q&A uh, sheet. So um, 
that is really about it. And I see that we do have a few minutes um, for questions. So we'll, we'll take a look at those. Um, and I just I really want to thank you for your interest in this grants program. Um, you know, I, I don't know, as, as many of you may know, um, you know, I came on board uh, in October of last year. And the assistive technology grants are just uh, one of my favorite programs. The, the, what, they, what they do, the impact that they have is really, really amazing. And it's um, mind-blowing and humbling to, to, you know, to learn about all that happens. So again, that's where the, the reports come in, and they're just so helpful. So um, we really look forward to receiving your submissions. And again, please direct all questions after this to qol at christopherreeve.org. Um, so let me take a look. And um, I see some questions. There's a question here that says, is there a stated limitation on indirect costs in the application? Um, Thank you. Um, so we have a 10% um, a indirect cost unless you already have, and here's where um, I stumble over this one, um, and, I, and I'm not able to put my hands on it. Um, if you already have a, um, an indirect cost rate that's negotiated with the federal government, then you are able to um, use that indirect cost rate. Um, but that is spelled out in the um, application itself. However, if you don't, there is a limit um, of 10% on indirect costs. Um, another question says, you mentioned grant cannot be directly provided to consumer. Okay, but uh, okay, but also mentioned home accessibility modifications can be potentially be approved. Yes. Um, so, do you see any issues with installing a ramp at a consumer's home? And no, no, uh, there are no issues with that, um, as long as and um, you know that these are temporary installations. So. A, you know, as part of a loan closet, you are able to install a ramp. Um, but Hey, this is Julie Lubinsky from the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, jumping in because it seemed to Mark we have lost Mark. Um, so I'm going to cut this short, and I have all your answers in the uh, question and answer, and I will make sure Mark sees them, and he can get back to you uh, with a follow-up email with this recorded presentation. So thank you all for joining us today. Hello, this is Mark. Oh, you're back on. Okay, I think thank everybody, you. I think everybody's on, Mark, okay. so you can keep talking. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I have no idea what happened there. All of a sudden, I was speaking and my phone went blank. Um, let me see uh, other questions as we just have a few more minutes here. Um,
someone said, we typically have several people working on a grant. How do we best approach that in terms of login? Um, what I would say is that um, it's always best to have one person in charge of the process. So um, if, you know, if you want to parse it out uh, th you know, through the web, uh, through the word document, and have people respond back to you, and you input that. That's really the the best way to go about it. The system is really only set up for one person to access it, unless you were to provide um, everybody with that same access uh, email and password. But you know, I, I would say that that's a possible workaround, but I, I do know that the, um, the online grants uh, people, the, the, the found in technology which develops this, did it so that there's really only one person to have access. Um, let me see. It says the last the last page said the applications were due by 9.17. Let me go back and take a look at that. Okay, so we're looking at the timeline, I guess, here. All right, this page says 9.16. Um, So I, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing that, but um, the applications are due on September 16th, um, so not the 17th. Um, anything else? Um, yes, there are a few that, again, go back to the home modifications. If we did a modification in a home such as grab bars, could you explain how that program could be sustainable if you cannot reuse the grab bars? So right, right. So it would be more about the program itself. Um, how are you able to work with your partners? Um, you know, is, you know, even without the, the refunding, if there's, uh, you know, if there have been partnerships that have been created, if there have been other sources of, of revenue that you've been able to secure because of the REVE grant, that's also an opportunity to, you know, to talk about sustainability. So, right, obviously if you're, you know, doing grab bars, there's, you know, not a way to make that sustainable, but you can certainly, uh, you know, think about the program itself as opposed to some of the individual components of it. Um, let me see if there are any more questions. So somebody asked, um, you know, does the foundation provide grants to commercial, commercial technology companies that are developing or selling assistive tech that improves quality of life? Um, and the, you know, the, the way I'm going to answer that is one certain, um, not through this program. This program is the High Impact Innovative Assistive Technology Program, and it is really for the, um, you know, the state and territory territory AT programs that are funded through the State Assistive Technology Act, um, at, you know, as well as the implementing agencies. Um, we do, through other um, grant programs, fund uh, companies. However, we are only able to fund nonprofit organizations. So, um, and as I had shared earlier, um, you know, if it's developing assistive technology, that would include most likely a um, um, wh what's the word? The um, uh, like the development of a prototype or intellectual, uh, intellectual property rights. So, um, n so no, we would we would not. However, again, you know, if you were a nonprofit organization, um, you know, please look at the other uh, programs under our quality of life uh, grant program. Um, there's another question. Um, somebody's asking when the slides will get posted. They, they'll hopefully be posted, you know, shortly after this, um, and if not, you know, today within the next day or two. Um, 
someone wrote, I am new to my organization this year. Can I assume that if we were awarded this past year for a QOL grant that we are already funded by the – no. No, so if you have been awarded a QOL grant for any of the other programs, you're most likely a nonprofit organization. Um, uh, you would know if you were um, a, you know, a, a, an organization that is funded through the State Assistive Technology Act. Um, so I would you know, definitely look at you know, if you were a direct effect grantee or if you were a um, high impact priority, you know, look at those programs again. Um, and we also do offer the, um, the brand new category which we just uh, opened, the expanded effects grants, and those are for projects that have uh, shown really amazing results and impact and are you know, moving forward in terms of replication. So let me see if there is another question. Um, can you repeat the answer to the question about equipment loan? Yes. So you know, again, that's always such a. So they're they're asking the question about equipment loans versus giving equipment to an individual. So the if, if through the loan closet, you're able to let's say offer an, a, a piece of assistive technology like an eye gaze, um, as opposed to giving that to someone. You're loaning it to them until um, other funds you know, um, per, per, perhaps Medicare funds are able to purchase it for them. Um, it's an opportunity for people to learn how to use the equipment. Same with when, um, you know, somebody's doing a demonstration. It allows them to demonstrate the piece of equipment, loan it then, or similar pieces of equipment to the um, you know, to the individuals so that they'll understand how to use the equipment and then if they're able to get the equipment themselves, then it, you know, goes back into the loan closet for somebody else to use at, a, at another time. So that is also why a lot of, you know, if it's an assistive um, technology loan closet, it, um, you know, the equipment's there which really aids in the whole thought behind sustainability. Um, let me see if there are any more. Um, can this grant be used to expand an already existing adaptive design and technology program and yes it can uh, it can certainly expand upon one when when i you know when i said earlier that it it's just not to fund uh, work that's already been done you know meaning that let's say you did a project last year and you're asking you know to be uh, for the funds to cover the expenses that happened last year so this is something that has to be moving forward um, but however um, if you are a previous applicant, um, it, it can certainly be an existing adaptive design and technology program, but it can't be the same project that had already previously been, been funded. So I think that's it in terms of the questions, which is great because we're right at 4 o'clock. So I want to thank all of you, thank all of you that have stayed on here, uh, even through the, the, the part where I got cut off. <laughs> and um, thank you for joining us. Uh, and again, these slides will be posted. Um, questions will be answered. The questions that have been answered here, you know, we'll be writing up responses to also, and everything will be posted posted on our website. So again, thank you. Um, and I just also quickly want to thank Julie Lebensky from the Reed Foundation, who's our Associate Director of Digital Communications. She's really responsible for you know, putting this whole thing together. So um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And again, any questions that you have, please send them to qol at christopherreeve.org. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.